Hello, everybody, and welcome back, I should say. So um, back in June, I posted a fairly longish slide deck on risk management, particularly speaking about or focusing on risk culture and the importance of uh, an appropriate risk culture in a bank to ensure that the risk management processes that are formally described are followed properly and appropriately. And I was pleased to see that a few uh, weeks after that, when the PRA published its report on the Credit Suisse um, failure, they spoke about risk culture. So I was quite chuffed about that, uh, particularly as that report came a few weeks after my slide deck. <laughs> now, uh, that comment, sorry, that, that deck uh, received quite a lot of comment on LinkedIn. And so I thought I would produce a, a video talking to that deck. But it was about 90 odd slides long. So uh, that would make quite an intolerable length in terms of video. So I've cut it right down. And we're going to try and attempt to cover this topic in the next uh, 12 to 15 minutes or so, possibly less. OK, so risk management, but particularly with a focus on the importance of obtaining or inculcating the right or appropriate risk culture in a bank. In the comments section with this post, you'll see a link to the original slide deck from earlier this year, from back in June, the long one. Right. So let's proceed. First of all, risk culture. This lecture title starts out with focusing on risk culture, but what actually do we mean by risk culture? And that's not uh, necessarily that easy to define. Uh, well, by that, I mean there is more than one definition of it. What do we speak of? What do we mean when we speak of culture, well, risk culture, or indeed culture in a bank? We could go first to a dictionary, and it being 2023, we're going to go into an online one. They define culture, those terms, if you like. Uh, they're saying it's essentially the ideas, customs and social behaviour of a particular people or society. And that's it's relevant and appropriate to risk culture in a bank. It goes on to say that risk culture is a set of norms, attitudes and behaviours related to awareness, management and controls of risks in a bank. It shapes management and employees' day-to-day -day decisions and has an impact on the risks they take. Again, fair enough. But that's that's almost verbiage. It's uh, yeah, great, fantastic. What exactly do we mean by that? I prefer a simpler definition. And to that, I'm going to point to principles of banking again uh, from the second edition. Well, from the first edition, I wrote about risk management principles um, ha uh, are identical, to, irrespective of what viewpoint one takes when looking at them. Uh, and I also say in the second edition that it's it's easy to define risk management, a risk management framework formally. That's actually quite straightforward. Uh, but the challenge, the real challenge, and I'll come to this at the end of today's presentation, uh, the real challenge is in actually making them happen, making them reality, okay? And that's what I think risk culture refers to. Actually doing in practice, in reality, what you say to your stakeholders that you will be doing. So in other words, if one has a risk management framework, and these days in just about every country around the world, banks are obliged to have them, making sure that what one says is the bank's risk approach and risk management approach and risk appetite and risk limits actually is followed in practice. So in other words, we do in reality what we say we're going to do, we present our risk management framework to, to stakeholders, all stakeholders, internal and external. And I think that is having the right risk culture. Now, let's take one step back and talk about this familiar topic known as enterprise risk management, ERM. An ERM uh, framework is, is commonly observed in banks around the world. In fact, in some jurisdictions, the regulatory authorities expect to see uh, the risk management framework described in ERM terms. Enterprise risk management defined slightly differently in different publications, uh, but in essence, or depending on which source you're looking, but in essence, it describes an integrated single approach to risk management as a whole that places all risks associated with the firm's operation into one single taxonomy. In theory, this avoids the silo mentality and approach of previous risk management methodologies. It's not a new concept. It's at least as old as the current century. Uh, and risk management in a bank following this would not be following a particularly new concept. Uh, concept. We're saying if we adopt an ERM mechanism, we have one view of risk. Again, something I just referred to when I, uh, look, when I referenced the textbook. We have one view of risk and we have a consistent approach to managing that risk within a single risk taxonomy. So far, so good. So far, words, words describing good practice. We might summarize, uh, if you see on the slide there, a generic ERM framework, uh, we might summarize it as follows. We could say that the ERM framework includes includes the governance, you know, the, the, the governance operating model, processes and systems. In, and in fact, I would also add policies, processes and systems, people and culture. So an ERM framework has a nod to risk culture as well. Your ERM framework isn't just the formal, it should be the risk culture element as well. And then the escalation process and reporting and continuous monitor, uh, monitoring and management and indeed improvement uh, that we undertake, uh, we, we, we should be following and applying through on a daily basis, on a routine, regular basis. 
Um, so that's the ERM process, the ERM framework. Again, nothing uh, particularly uh, controversial or debatable about that. It's fairly straightforward. We understand it. As I said, regulators generally expect to see an ERM type approach. So to me, it's not a challenging issue. There's a consulting firm that I've been, whose publications I've been reading uh, on the internet recently, which I quite liked. It's the Protect Group. Uh, they they published this uh, this nice diagram about uh, ER, an ERM framework, the one on the right, and they described it uh, the ERM framework as being constituted of these five parts. And I quite like this summary. And their baseline, the base, if you like, the foundations of this building is people and culture. Okay, that's the foundations, as they as they as they uh, term it, of the whole ERM framework. And at the top, one has the governance structure, the formal governance structure, which starts usually with the board of directors. Okay, so that I, I like that diagram because to me the risk culture is important. You can have all the formal frameworks in the world, but if the culture isn't right and the people aren't living the reality of that of the framework, the, the risk management framework, then of course it's not going to be followed in practice. So I quite liked that, which is why I've referenced the slide from, from this particular firm, the Protect Group. Now, now in theory, a robust ERM framework will enable risk management processes and systems that cover the full life cycle of risk, cover the full range of risks. Remember, uh, we cover, we, we've discussed this in previous videos about the risk management framework. When we talk about the risk register, the, that's the the list of all the risks that a bank is exposed to as part of its daily operations. And um, there are a, a significant number of additional items on that register today in 2023 than there might have been, say, 10 years ago. We've seen the emergence of climate change risk management and cyber risk and, and additional money laundering risks in a way that they might, and, and reputational risk, for example, social media risk, that's a new one. That might not have been on a bank's risk register. Some of them might not have been anyway uh, in, in 2013. So uh, the ERM framework covers the full life cycle of risk on daily basis, daily processes, the full range of all the risk types. They should be, uh, the framework, processes, the processes underpinning that ERM framework should be integrated with each other uh, across this central register, which is why, in theory, one has a second line of defence. The idea being that in the independent oversight function is, is that what's carried out by the second line of defence, the risk management function, again, to enable this integrated approach to risk management. And in theory, the ERM framework should enable a tailoring of processes specific to a particular bank and also specific to the particular risks being managed. If we want to have a, a, an efficient ERM framework, we, we will need to have uh, efficient and adequate MI reporting as well, hence the importance of a, of a risk dashboard. Now, in most jurisdictions, as I said, banks are required to develop and implement an ERM, implement an ERM framework. Uh, my, my definition of this was, in essence, for a bank, this means having a risk management framework that enables the definition, measurement, monitoring, mitigation, and management to calibrate risk appetites of all the risk exposures that a bank faces in the ordinary course of its business. And that would include having in place tolerance for risk exposures. Hence, we have, driving on from that, a risk appetite statement with quantitative limits of every type of risk exposure the bank is exposed to. We have quantitative risk indicators and limits for every type of risk. What does a good ERM framework look like? Now, do you remember this? It's, if you don't, <laughs> you, may, you need to go to chapter 18 in the second edition of Principles of Banking. Uh, we've got a description of the risk management framework uh, on the left-hand side, starting with the governance uh, framework, the, the board structure, uh, and uh, going all the way down to the policies and processes. And this would include, as I say there, the committee structure, the risk management philosophy, the risk culture, which I'm going to come to. The risk culture slots in sort of in the middle there, uh, although I haven't explicitly put it on the, uh, it's, 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 sorry, not in the middle, it's in the second box there, the risk culture on the strategy and business plan. We've got the formal, the quantitative risk appetite statement, uh, we've got the policy documents, and then we've got everything, and usually the regulator expects to see this, we've got all of this couched in the frameworks of the three lines of defence, first line, second line, and third line. Now, we take what's in that previous slide forward, and we have to make sure it's embedded throughout the business lines, okay? And I've got on slide 13 there, some basic principles of uh, how one would ensure that the risk appetite statement was embedded throughout the bank so that those people who were originating risk were aware of it and could manage their operations and processes to the risk appetite of the bank, the, the, the board approved risk appetite of the bank. It's a common question in, in, um, in regulator reviews and threat meetings. How does, uh, you know, how do, how do you ensure, how does one ensure that the risk appetite statement is embedded throughout the business? Okay, so slide 13 is essentially a summary, a very short summary of the processes that a bank would follow to ensure that risk appetite was embedded throughout the bank. 
Now, I said that uh, an important part of the ERM and indeed the RMF framework in the bank is having efficient risk reporting. And given that uh, when we look at the failures this year, the bank failures this year, given that there's lots of information available, um, it's not always straightforward to, to get quickly the most important information. The risk dashboard, particularly the summary risk dashboard, is very important. I've got some examples to il illustrate. Here's a one page of board summary, left hand side, all the various risk types and then uh, a you know, historical pattern of what the number has been for the last three months or within green or whatever the color needs to be, red, amber, green or red, amber, yellow, green, as I, as I like to put it. So that's one example. I quite like this one, which has key balance sheet metrics all on one page for the hypothetical Chad West Bank surplus cash on the left hand side. That's an old friend of mine from that I instituted from my RBS days. Um, uh, the cash position in the middle, you've got the key capital and liquidity metrics. Uh, there's a comment at the top about interest rate metrics, a one page summary balance sheet MI position is really, really useful from the board's perspective. Okay, so that way one doesn't risk losing the wood from the wood for the trees or missing the wood for the trees, uh, which sometimes happens when there's an excess of information provided. So there's an example of a one pager uh, ALCO summary or board summary uh, that helps make the management to risk appetite more efficient, easier, because it, it's a summary position of all the key balance sheet risks. I've got two other examples to show, but that's in the long slide deck that was in the previous public uh, previous posting. Now, let's take the formal, which is everything I've been talking about up to now, and then tie it in with risk culture. In other words, making the risk management framework real, hence risk culture for real. Risk culture has been defined a number of ways. I attempted to define it at the start. Uh, I, I gave a simple definition at the start, but I've got an even simpler one, which I would call simply doing the right thing or, or do good work. Um, I'd like to leave it at that, but probably that doesn't cover exactly what I mean. So, where we can define it into a little bit more detail saying a firm's culture is its beliefs and attitudes that everyone shares, so it's shared values. And then the risk culture is a unifying shared approach to managing risk. And it does have to be shared. It has to be something that everyone buys into. Uh, and that's something that's key when I say at the end, risk management isn't simply the preserve of the second line defense or the compliance function or the CRO. We're all risk managers and that's an important part of a bank's risk culture. So hence culture made up of beliefs, values, expectations, practices, etc. It's driven by certainly tone from the top, driven by the behaviors and the patterns and the practices set by the senior management. It should be accepted throughout the firm. And it and again, I reiterate, it needs to be something that is is uniformly believed in. We've all got to buy into that risk management um, framework and the appetite that the board has said we should manage to. OK. And if we do this, we will be adopting, hopefully, uh, an appropriate risk culture that will make the risk management framework easier to observe and follow in practice. I'm going to stick to my uh, unifying mantra, which is the right risk culture is the right ethical approach to doing business. And that is doing the right thing when no one is looking there at the bottom of the slide. Uh, it's a favorite of mine. Good practice or doing the right thing is doing the right thing when no one else is looking. Now, slide 20 on conduct builds on from that. Um, you know, we, we, we say that for conduct risk to be mitigated well or managed well, we do need to actually do what we say we're doing. And that goes back to having the right culture. Conduct risk is, is a risk register item on a bank's risk management framework. Uh, and it's all about uh, treating customers fairly, the right outcomes for customers in terms of their product delivery, their, their reaching their goals. And we're mitigating it. We're, we're helping to mitigate it by having the right risk culture in place. Now, here's a really good case study. It's an obscure one, MS Amblin, Amblin Underwriting Limit. It's a case study from a publication from last year from the UK's regulatory authority, the PRA. And it's obscure, but there's a really good lesson learned from it if one reads the report. And there's a link there at the top of the slide. It's on the Bank of England's website. It's really good lessons learned, even if one is unfamiliar with the firm or indeed the operating business it was in. Because if you read the report, the regulator is saying that the institution failed in its risk management because there wasn't a strong risk culture. And my takeaway from reading that report was that you can have the framework in place, but if you look at the bottom of the slide, policies only protect if you actually follow them. And having a second line and a third line defense only works if you actually act on their findings and recommendations. So if you read this report for this obscure firm that was fined for failings in its governance, it had the formal frameworks in place, but the risk culture wasn't enabling the formal frameworks to be followed in practice. And that is what I think having the right risk culture means really good lesson for me is, of course, 
a GCFI failure from earlier this year, which was Credit Suisse, or as I like to describe it, slipping from one banana skin to another. Uh, now I can say this because the firm is now, you know, now part of UBS and and has failed. Um, but uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, year in, year out, it was quite common to read about um, negative news stories in the mainstream media. I mean, the mainstream media, not the business media. And I always think if you f go from one to the next, it's uh, it's it ceases to look like misfortune, as as a character in an Oscar Wilde novella once said. Here's just a random sample. If you do a search of, of, of fines uh, that Credit Suisse received for various um, sanctions, violations, money laundering, tax evasion, fraud, uh, it's a very long list. I wouldn't say it's endless. It's not even almost endless, but it's a very long list. And um, uh, across a number of jurisdictions. I mean, look, there's a BBC report, there's Le Monde, there's something from the Office of Public Affairs in the US, there's a Reuters report, all on different, um, well, different failings, if you like. And it doesn't matter, and obviously lots of banks have received lots of fines over the last 15 odd years for lots of things, but uh, when one observes an institution, whether it's large or small, going from one failure in an aspect of his business to another, I, I don't know about you, but my conclusion is the risk culture is not the appropriate one, because uh, as I'm fond of saying, uh, large banks all have very prescriptive, in-depth, detailed, formal risk um, management frameworks and policies. So clearly it's the operation of them that's failing here rather than having the formal frameworks. So to me, because banking is first and foremost confidence and a loss of confidence leads, in, in some cases we saw this year, very quickly to a loss of viability, not having the right risk culture can, Im can result in implosion or explosion because even though formally you have everything in place, in practice it's not happening. OK, um, now with Credit Suisse, the various banana skins, one to another, ultimately led to a loss in confidence. And a good indicator of that is actually the CDS price for that institution. Have a look uh, in the appendix, a couple of slides on where the C Credit Suisse CDS price was relative to EU bank averages. Uh, that was an indication of loss of confidence. But what had led to that loss of confidence? To me, my take of it was it was lead. It was one bad news story from another to another leading to another that led to this ultimate loss of confidence. And of course, when at certain particular indicators went very high, like the credit default swap price, uh, that confidence, that loss of confidence becomes difficult to bear or to withstand. Now, as um, I have been saying or implying right from the start, um, on the surface, this bank's risk management framework was as comprehensive and all-encompassing all as any that one would ex expect to observe anywhere. Being a globally systemically important bank, uh, it would have had to have a comprehensive and all-encompassing risk management framework. Uh, from my time working at a, at a systemically important financial institution, I'm familiar with very detailed, in-depth, prescriptive, all-encompassing policies, processes, risk management frameworks, risk limits, um, first line and second line and third line, committees, approval processes, you name it, it's all there. It's, it's very comprehensive. So it wasn't as if the firm um, didn't ha had something lacking there. In theory, at least, the risk management firm, the risk management framework at any GCFI bank is fit for purpose. Think of all the people who've approved it, from the board of directors to the regulatory authorities to the consultants that they always bring in on a regular basis to review all the aspects of the risk risk management framework. Think of all the people, uh, the second line of defence, the third line of defence. Think of all the various bodies and forums that have been involved in signing off aspects of a GCFI bank's risk management framework. So, in theory, we conclude we can conclude that the risk management framework was fit for purpose, but in practice, it turned out not to be. And for me, I can conclude only that ultimately, if I'm going to pick one thing, it's a failure of risk. It's a failure of risk culture. So let us conclude using those two very different case studies. To, to uh, uh, let us draw conclusions from using those two very different case studies. One, the obscure unknown firm MS Amlin Underwriting, that in the PR report was shown to have failings in its risk governance, primarily. Uh, sourced down to a failure or poor risk culture. And from what I conclude, from my observation of what happened to Credit Suisse, that while it had the formal frameworks in place in some depth, um, in some breadth and depth, in practice, there was something wrong with its risk culture that meant that, that, meant that the risk management framework wasn't actually, wasn't actually being followed for real. OK, and hence the third bullet point there on the slide, foreign risk management framework to be effective, and to prevent failure for firm specific reasons, uh, the operation of said RMF must be undertaken within an environment that promotes and fosters effective risk culture. And that's a lot harder to write about than the formal theoretical 
frameworks. OK, so you're now listening is thinking, OK, you made your point. So what? <laughs> what can I do about it? How do I go about ensuring, you know, a halfway decent or a halfway fit for purpose risk culture? Well, as I said, that is harder to write about. So uh, what I'm going to do is just present a summary of uh, a high level summary of one or two pointers that we might want to consider when assessing the risk culture in our firm. So there you go. Slide 28. Recommendations for effective risk culture. Now, I implied them at the beginning, but here are some more practical ones. Uh, in my personal opinion, only individuals have demonstrated an observable peer confirmed track record of commitment to implementing sound risk culture in banks should be elevated to positions of seniority and authority and responsibility. We need to act on and make real the bank's formal risk management policies, and we can do practical things to help that. So as I say there on this, as, uh, number two, uh, item number two, simplicity, simplicity, succinctness, clear language at, at all times in all policy documents and process maps helps embed risk management frameworks and build good risk culture. Uh, senior executive must lead from the front in building a team culture that emphasizes a shared goal. Uh, and that kind of leads on from item number one. Um, I might throw in remuneration policy, but sometimes that's a red herring. Uh, you can be the, the best paid, and the worst performer, or you can be the poorly paid and still believe in risk culture. Uh, remuneration policy is relevant, but it's sometimes a red herring. Uh, clear, accurate and succinct MI is really important and needs to be actually read and understood by all senior execs from the board downwards. Hence my mention earlier of um, uh, of a one pager summary that captured accurately and in, in, in summary fashion the balance sheet risk position of the bank. We can't get away from the next one. Genuine technical knowledge and expertise needs to be exhibited by the C-suite and the board of directors. At the end of the day, certain aspects of balance sheet risk management, like liquidity risk and interest rate risk, two, um, two, <laughs> two, two factors that uh, led to the demise of uh, those US banks, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank earlier this year. We can't get away from the fact that there is a, an element of technical knowledge and expertise required. And uh, our governance framework for managing balance sheet risk and indeed reputational risk needs to be effective and reviewed to be effective regularly. I've got to some words to say about Alco's positioning on that, the Asset Liability Committee's position on that as well. And um, embed risk management processes into the firm's daily practice through an effective risk culture. Well, hence see, see the slides from now through on to the end. Embed the role and influence of second line defense and third line defense within the business. The takeaway from that obscure case study that I re referenced just now was that they had a second line defense and third line defense, but they weren't really following what they were saying. So again, that 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 negates their effectiveness. It makes it uh, it makes it uh, practically less relevant that there is a three lines of defense framework in place. Not to say that the three lines of defense framework is 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 the be all and end all of risk management. It's potentially a necessary but usually always not a sufficient condition for long-term viability. And also we should assess effective risk culture, okay? How can we assess whether we have the right risk culture in, in the bank? Uh, here is a potential checklist to consider. A positive risk culture includes the following attributes. Employees at every level appropriately consider and manage risk as an intrinsic part of their day-to-day -day role. That to me is a key point. We are all risk managers. Risk management isn't the sole preserve of the second line of defense or the internal audit function or the compliance department or the CRO. We're all risk managers. Hence my earlier point about the right risk culture being one where we all have a shared vision and objective and appreciation of the risk management framework in a bank. So we should have a positive risk culture would, would reflect that employees at every level across the firm consider managing risk as an intrinsic part of their own their own role, their own function. In assessing culture or an appropriate culture, we should consider tone from the top. As I said earlier, culture comes from the top down. So they need to be setting the right culture. But there needs to be accountability as well uh, in terms of if things go wrong, there is accountability for errors, not so much a blame culture, which to me is the opposite of getting the right team teamwork effectiveness. There should be an accountability uh, for those who have responsibilities specified uh, explicit responsibility for managing various aspects of the risk management framework. Um, turn from the top, we want to assess that the leadership from the board downwards promotes, monitors and assesses the risk culture of the bank uh, and considers the impact of said culture on, on the bank's balance sheet. Accountability, assess that relevant employees at all levels understand the bank's core values and its approach to risk. That's almost 
allied or tied up with the, the first item, the first bullet point there. And there should be effective communication and challenge. We should assess that. And there is in, in the bank, whether at the committee level or on the on the at the coalface level, there is an environment of open communication and effective challenge promoted within decision making and approval making, approval granting processes, so that we can have the appropriate exchange of views, discuss a range of views, and always it always ensure uh, an environment of open and constructive dialogue continuous dialogue and engagement that's really easy to write on a slide by the way the, ch <laughs> the challenge is making it happen for real okay so uh and the final word how can we embed the right risk culture i don't think uh the answer to that is more regulation uh in my personal opinion regulation which is vitally important if we are to maintain systemic safety and soundness for the banking industry as a whole regulation is absolutely vital it's it's um you know it's it's it it, it, it can't be replaced it, it's it's unavoidable but to me regulation is not culture for me to me it's essentially process and bureaucracy so the answer to embedding the right risk culture isn't more regulation in my view three things will help embed the right risk culture one adopt the view that i mentioned from the previous slide we're all risk managers. Uh, managing risk is not the, the role of only a particular department or individual. Uh, reiterate what I said earlier, if we are going to have the right risk culture, we should have in place senior execs from the board downwards who, ha who have demonstrated uh, a track record on, and peer recognized commitment to implementing sound risk culture. Notice how I say track record of commitment to implementing a sound risk culture, including those assessment points that I said earlier about an open, engaging, uh, uh, environment, uh, an environment of open dialogue and engaging conversation, exchange of views. A commitment to that is what's asked for here in, on that slide. It's not about a commitment to delivering PL or, or a commitment to a commitment to growing the balance sheet. A track record of commitment to implementing a sound risk culture is important if we're to have the right risk culture in banks. And we try and foster a team spirit within the bank that places places maintaining the good name of the bank above all other objectives maintaining the reputation of the bank and its good name above all other objectives now that might be more challenging in fact it probably is more challenging than it sounds in fact it sounds challenging and it's probably more challenging than that if that makes sense uh, but that's important as well if we all had that same shared view and opinion about maintaining the good name of the bank then we are on the right road towards inculcating the right risk cult culture or or embedding the right risk culture in a bank. Um, now, the following slide is an extract from the afterword to the principles of banking, second edition, and speaks to risk culture. And I will just finish on that. And I'm just, I'm not going to read that whole page. You can go to that. <laughs> it's, I, I believe it's uh, it's page 773. Uh, but if you look down there at the bottom, um, what I say there is that, um, or halfway through that page, really, uh, we have to remember that every time in recent failures, whether it's 2008 or 2023, we have to remind ourselves that uh, banks weren't operating in a kind of lawless Wild West environment. They had in place uh, for some years now, way before 2008, they had in place governance frameworks, regulation, regulatory rules, audit committees, risk committees, ALCO committees, um, risk appetite statements, first line, second line, third line defense, risk limits, all these were in place. All these were in place in 2008 and all the years leading up to 2008 and all these were in place in the years leading up to to 2023 and yet banks still fail so to me the challenge is 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 getting the right risk culture and that's the hard bit as i say there on the afterwards um writing about this formally is the easy bit we can write this on a powerpoint slide i've been presenting a powerpoint slide to you the last uh the last half an hour uh we, we 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 can write this in a in a powerpoint slide uh we can write it in a textbook the challenge is to take it out of the formal and the theoretical and make it real and that speaks to having the right risk culture okay right i'm going to stop there and hope that was of use to you a bit longer than i thought um i'm sure by the time you get to this point we've split the video into more than one part uh but i hope that was of use and the thanks for your company and i'll see you soon Bye-bye.